we are here at AU Bank Samvad. Please welcome our speakers, Pradeep Krishan and Pranay Lal. And they're going to be talking about the rise and fall of dinosaur in India. This session is presented by Dainik Bhaskar. Once again, a round, big round of applause to our speakers. Thank you. जो आपकी सोच का दायरा बढ़ाए जो आपको हर दिन नया नॉलेज दे वो जो आपको रखे वक्त से आगे पढ़िए वो वेट फॉर दर्ज हेलो एंड वेलकम एवरीबॉडी टू दिस सेशन ऑन द राइज एंड फॉल ऑफ द डायनासोर्स आई जस्ट वॉन्ट टू बिगिन बाय placing in context uh, Pranay's book, Indica, which the subtitle of which is A Deep Natural History of the Indian Subcontinent. But I want to try and give you a sense of what an important book this is. It, it was released a little over a year ago uh, and published by Penguin. And um, you know, in the context of books on natural history that are written in this country, or that have been written so far in this country, this was just a complete, um, what's the word? Just, just something that took us all completely by surprise, because it's, it's kind of called a field guide, if you like, but it's, it was a tour de force of, and an account of what has happened in this part of the world from the birth of the solar system right up to the time that man first sets foot in South Asia. And for people who are not familiar with, with you know, what's tended to happen in India is that paleontology has remained uh, the, the province of people who study it professionally, academically. It's never really filtered down to, the po to a popular level. So for people like myself and you know, thousands of other people who would have been terrifically interested in this subject. Here was the subject laid out for you in a completely reader-friendly way by a man whose qualifications to do so are, sound a bit unlikely when you first hear about it, but actually makes complete sense when you think about it. Somebody who's a chemist and a biochemist and a virologist. He's not a professional paleontologist, but he also has immense amounts of, of persistence, and a burning interest for, you know, for decades, he's been actually tracking new developments, new research into paleontology. And he's put together this absolutely wonderful book, which, you know, as I said, completely blazed the trail in terms of anything written in, in the field of natural history in India. Now, I'm not going to waste any more time with, with um, introductions, but I'm going to ask you, Pranay, if you can just um, prepare the ground by giving a sense to us of where dinosaurs stand in the, you know, in, in the great sweep of time that we're talking about. And then let's get into dinosaurs in a little more detail from there. Uh, thank you so much for being here. I know it's Sunday and there are some great sessions happening uh, in the other courtyard. Uh, you've got Osama bin Laden and you've got Lenin to compete with. And I think dinosaurs are still a hot favorite. So thank you for being here. Uh, thank you also uh, Jaipur Virasat uh, Foundation for hosting such a lovely event. Uh, I think uh, they've done an amazing job for now over a decade. Uh, I also wanted to uh, thank uh, you know uh, lots of people who've uh, loved the book and you know continue to support uh, what I have written. So I'm thanks. Uh, thank you, Pradeep, for the generous introduction as well. Um, I'm going to talk about, uh, can I have the first slide, please? If you don't mind, I'll stand up and, yeah. yeah. First slide, please. Nishtha? There's no slide changer, so I'm sorry, I'll have to say next slide, please, yeah. So I'm not going to call my talk uh, Rise and Fall, but I say Rise and Rise of Dinosaurs, and I, I'm going to say this because, uh, to me, dinosaurs live in our imagination, and uh, also dinosaurs are something that are enduring in their quality and their, in their persistence in our imagination. So I think uh, dinosaurs have never fallen off uh, ever since they have been discovered in the 17th century or 18th century, early 18th century. Not, not audible? Okay, volume please. 
I think they've got it now. Is this good? Is this good? Great, thanks. So next slide, please. OK, let's get a perspective. We're talking about a time just before the dinosaurs. I want to tell you what was happening on Earth. OK, is this better? OK, two mics. Dinos get two mics. OK, 290 million years ago, the star that you see on the screen is where India was. It was under the influence of a massive ice age that was receding, but it was still covered in ice. Okay? And Greenland, for example, which is north, you know, you see that white patch in the center is where Greenland was, and it was a tropical forest. So it's completely the opposite of what is happening. And, it's, and at this time, a massive volcanic event takes place, and all the ice that you see now that's covering Australia, South America, India, eastern parts of, uh, of Africa, and Antarctica get defreezed from this cover of ice. Okay? Next slide, please. And the forests that cover, that cover the earth at this time comprise uh, horse tails, club mosses, lycopods, something that have now shrunk to no, no bigger than three inches or two inches in, in size, were the giants of the time. But they were cycads. You know, the, the thing that we call palms and that is in our uh, gardens, right? But it's not a true palm. It's, a, it's actually not related to the palm. It's called a cycad, right? And cycad, which is in the foreground, is, is, the, is the tree that used to dominate in the time. And they were, they were lots of water in which such plants used to survive. There was usually f uh, the forest of this time was inundated with water. And most of the time, there would be uh, either tide coming in, or, the, or, or most of this forest was in lagoonal uh, conditions. Next slide, please. And the creatures that live before the dinosaurs were very fascinating. Earth or land was ruled by creatures which we now call the amphibians, the frogs. And you look at the creature on the left of your screen, it's called Lystrosaurus. It was one of the largest amphibians of all time. It was the size of a Volkswagen car, a very large creature. It was a grazer. It would not eat meat, but it was like a giant cow. They would live in herds, and they would feed on the palms, the horse tails, and the ferns. Okay. Lurking in the water was a, a crocodile ancestor called the Chasmosaurus. In the foreground, you see a rat-like creature, and that is our ancestor, a mammal-like reptile. Okay, It's not truly a mammal, but a mammal-like reptile. And what it's eating is a reptile. Okay, Reptiles were small. Mammal-like reptiles that had emerged from the reptiles were also small. But the true reptiles lived in water, and they were crocodiles. And the other large creature of the time were the amphibians, like the Lystrosaurus the one that you see on the left. So this is something before the time of the dinosaur. And then, next slide, please. Something terrible happens. Around 252 million years ago, something happened on Earth, and scientists do not know what happened, but what they know is there was a massive methane poisoning. The source of the methane is contentious. Let's not go into that, because it's a scientific dilemma. But Earth was covered by methane. It became hot, and the seas turned inky blue or purple. It was very, very hot, and most of these creatures began to die. This was the biggest extinction event ever to occur. Now, this is important in terms of dinosaurs, because some things that lived before them began to perish. But some creatures did survive. Okay? There were small pools of water, there were small caves, and there were other places where creatures could escape this mass poisoning that happened on Earth. And those were the creatures, the, some of those creatures that survived were the ones that became the ancestors of the dinosaurs. Next slide, please. One of the reptiles that survived was this creature called Malerisaurus. Maleri is a village in Andhra Pradesh. Okay? Uh, it's called Malerisaurus, as in Maleri's Saurus. Saurus is lizard, the lizard of Maleri. They found two beautiful specimens next to each other. We imagine that they lived in pairs. This is what paleontologists believe. Uh, we know that there's some social uh, 
uh, lizards as well. So that's the imagination that they have. This was about two and a half feet long. And they could walk or run on two feet. Next slide, please. But the first true reptiles to emerge was about 210 to 208 million years ago. And one of the earliest ones to be found globally was the one in India called Al Volcaria. There was a, it's named after a paleontologist called Al Walker. So it's called Al Volcaria. Okay? The other dinosaur that was discovered in America called Eoraptor, or the, the dawn of the dinosaurs. Eo is dawn, and Raptor is a small, uh, mobile, extremely fast moving dinosaur, the Raptor. Even this is a raptor. It's a small, chicken-sized creature. It's no, no uh, higher than my knee, but possibly a vicious creature in the sense that it would have uh, dominated over smaller reptiles that were still not as aggressive as this creature. So what we know about this early dinosaur is that it used to hunt at a time when the sun would have been out. It would warm itself and look for smaller creatures in the forest floor or around lagoons. We've, uh, so we've got about eight fossils of Alvolcaria in India, near complete. And they have been found from different zones and zonations. And it's, it's fascinating because a creature like this has now, we know that it's very cosmopolitan. Right? Next slide, please. But the earliest discovery, the first fossil to be discovered and to be recorded in India, was way back in 1828 by a captain in a regiment that was posted in Jabalpur called William Sleeman. William Sleeman is a famous man because he's the man who was tasked to fight Thuggy. You remember Thuggy, that notorious practice of throttling people and you know, looting caravans and and camps and parties. So Thagi was a practice in central India which was practiced by certain tribes. And he was tasked to fight Thagi. And, but Sleeman found these very, very large bones in, the, in a cantonment just outside of Jabalpur in a place called Chota Shimla Hills and Bada Shimla Hills. Okay? And there is a very famous temple there called Pat Baba Mandir, which is a very good place to go and find your fossils for yourselves or find Dinosaur eggs. It's a very, very good place. If you ever go to Jabalpur, do visit this place. It's, it's very, very good. And the, the, the complex of the temple also has a lot of dinosaur fossils. They've not classified it. They're just littered. Just go and have a, have a look. This, these fossils that Sleeman uh, found were not classified or, discov uh, or described until uh, two other scientists, Falconer and Richard Lydecker, uh, who did it in 1877, uh, finally gave it a name. He classed them together and pieced them together and started giving it a shape and said that this belonged to a giant herbivore. And he called them Titanosaurus. It became a name that would stick for a very long time. Okay? Now, when Lydecker was writing about this, the British press was loving it. They started imagining a world of dinosaurs which were large and massive and you know, amazing. And it just fired the imagination of so many people in, in, in England that Arthur Conan Doyle, who read an early work by Richard Lydecker, wrote, wrote uh, the, uh, the, the book, uh, you know, uh, The Lost Planet, after, after reading this. So Arthur Conan Doyle, who's famous for writing Sherlock Holmes, also wrote a science fiction work. Right? And it became a very, very important book. Uh, for, the, for the time. Next slide, please. And this is what a titanosaur actually looks like. Uh, it's an entire class of giant herbivores which actually feed on here, in, in this case, an orcaria. It's a tall pine-like tree, and they just feed on the tops and, and not good, okay. Feed on the tops of, uh, of the trees and, and, and browse and just, just go. They have a large provenance on which they would, uh, they would you know, amble through and across a large tract of forest. Next slide, please. The second important find that happened, and possibly the first important find to happen in India after independence, was this one. Uh, I can't show you the image of the, the actual fossil, because the fossil is lost. 
and the print uh, that, is, that exists in the journal in which it is printed is so bad that you can't make out uh, the head or tail of it, to be, to be really honest. It, it just looks like a smudgy thing on a stone. But the reconstruction that happened, which is more recent in 2008, is that it was a flying reptile called a pterosaur. So that was a very important discovery, and, and, the, and the story behind that discovery is very fascinating. So these two paleontologists were, you know, working in Kota, not far from here, and it was a very hot day. They decided to rest in the in a hut of a farmer, and as they sat uh, in that uh, farmer's hut for lunch, uh, they saw a pattern on a block of sandstone, and it looked pretty intriguing and interesting, so they have had a look at it, and they found this fossil. So it's as simple as that. They were not excavating, and they were not looking for, of course, they were looking for something, but they found it in somebody's house, plastered on the wall. So simple as that. Um, I'm just wondering, Prana, if you can t give us a, a sense of how, when paleontologists see, uh, you, know, the, 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 you know, the fossil of an animal like this, how do they reconstruct what the markings or the colors might have been like? What is the process by which this is done? Well, good question, Pradeep. Uh, one of the things that uh, uh, physiologists, anatomists, and uh, you know, all the other scientists do is try imagining the environment in which the creature lived. Right? So you would have colors that would, uh, would not be so bizarre or so out of context. So for example, this bird would be uh, or this pterosaur, sorry, it's a reptile, it's not a bird yet, uh, would be uh, something that would have a belly which is white because uh, it would try merging with something which is in the sky, right? And much of it is light colored. You need uh, colors on your back because if you are resting on the ground, it needs to blend with the rock on which you are. So it could be grayish, bluish, uh, brownish, you know, those kind of things. So th these are imaginations. These are, this is what we... Uh, as, as scientists predict, could be. There have been some instances where skin fragments have got preserved, and the chromatophores, the color uh, that is held in, in the cells, has got preserved, and scientists have been able to predict the color. So that's fascinating, but that's too few. I think there are 10 or 12 such cases where they found the skin of a stegosaurus, or, a, a, or a, even a tyrannosaurus uh, a skull case had a patch of skin on it, and they have been able to now predict the color of a Tyrannosaurus. And it was not purple, it was not red, it was not pink, it was not, none of that, it was dark green, right? And now it's actually informed the behavior of dinosaurs as well, uh, because everybody imagined that Tyrannosaurus or creatures like them, the massive carnivores, would have actually chased its uh, prey and, you know, uh, you know, just cycled around like in its two feet uh, running behind a prey. Well, that could be the case, but it was a stealth predator. It would have used its color to hide behind foliage and tried surprising its prey. Because the prey also would have a defense mechanism. Either it would be fast or it would be very large. And you don't want to get injured, right? So that's one thing that people have started, paleontologists have started understanding in terms of color, physiology, anatomy, morphology, and therefore behavior. You know? a, a big... Uh, not working? Thank you. Uh, it's a big leap of imagination, but it's, it all adds up, I guess. I think what we know, what we know now is that it is uh, it's it's little better than what we knew about say 50 years ago. So let's let's continue with this. Next slide, please. One of the uh, the uh, most important discoveries that we've made in terms of large herbivores after the titanosaurs was this discovery that was made in Andhra Pradesh in 1975. It's called Barapasaurus tagorai. 1975 was the year when the hundredth birth anniversary of uh, Rabindranath Tagore was being celebrated. Yeah? So it was called Barapasaurus Tagorai. Right? And it's, it was found in an entire herd. It was found in an in a area of about 800 square meters, and there were 40 individuals, you know, comprising a matriarch right at the head of the herd, and two or three other large adults on the side of the herd, 
and in the middle, smaller uh, babies and juveniles, and in the end, another matriarch. So it's like an elephant herd, you know, or a, or a, or a wild beast herd. You've got the large, the more experienced creatures, you know, the mothers or the fathers and the elders in the front and the sides protecting the babies in the center. So, it's, so we've got fossils like these, not, not in India, in Australia, in Chile, in a lot of them in the US, and all of them t tell us that dinosaurs and reptiles of the time were evolved and had m maternal instincts and protective instincts. I think that is kind of fascinating because the fossils are telling you that story. Um, Next one, slide, one thing, uh, Pranay, can you, can you just uh, explain to us, how would you get a finding like this? What, what would the event have, what kind of event would have led to our finding a, a, you know, a whole herd of, of dinosaurs like this? How would it have come about? Uh, good question, Pradeep. Um, <clears throat> um, so what geologists and paleontologists do is that they have an understanding of the age of rocks. And they know that these are the layers in which uh, fossils can be found. So there are areas which show exposures, where, where rock formations are exposed and it's relatively easy for you to dig or to even look around carefully and you might find fragments of rock or, or fossil, which may mean that there is a fossil here. So m most of the times it's prospecting for fossil, looking out for those telltale signs that will say that you, will, you may find a fossil here. In this case, the Barapasaurus case, it was actually a limestone mine. And the local villagers used to, uh, who used to work in the quarry would say that we find giant bones all the time. And the, one of the most revered people of, in, in paleontology in India, Sohanlal Jain, went here and found an amazing variety of, uh, of dinosaurs and reptiles and fish. And, and several other creatures. I mean, he's written a prolific amount of uh, 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 literature based on discoveries that he's made and his teams have made in this area where, where this was found. And next slide, please. Next, please. Next, yeah. Uh, I'm going to come to, you know, everybody wants to know that, oh, we found so many grazers, you know, all these sauropods with long necks and, you know, huge bodies feeding on trees. But what about who used to eat them? And this used to be a chronic problem for paleontologists to explain. We didn't have a sexy predator, okay? And we finally found one. So they found a lump of rock in 1982 in a place called, the site is called Temple Hill, and, this, and the region is called Rayoli. It's uh, between Baroda and Anand. It's just off Charothar, actually. Uh, and this rock was kept in the GSI, in the Geological Survey of India, and forgotten. And it was rediscovered, that's why I write this word. It was rediscovered in 1994 by Professor Ashok Sahani. The person who discovered this rock in 1982 lives in Jaipur. Unfortunately, he's not here, otherwise he wanted to be here for, our, for this session. I would have loved to have him on the stage. Uh, he's just had a cataract operation, right? His name is Suresh Srivastava. He's, uh, he's acknowledged in my book and also in the chapter where, because he's made some important discoveries as well. Uh, but it was only in 2003 when two very prominent paleontologists from Chicago, Fields Museum, came to, uh, to Jaipur and separated the rock and the bone and pieced the bones together to come up with the, this creature which we call Rajasaurus narmadiensis. Now Rajasaurus as in Raja as in the king, Saurus as in the lizard, the king lizard of the Narmada. Okay? Now, how does Rajasaurus stack up against something like, say, a T-Rex? Okay, the T-Rex was bigger, okay? But Rajasaurus was smaller, but possibly would be more uh, effective or more vicious in a fight if you were to pitch both of them together. Now, how do we know this? Uh, anybody here has seen a series called Jurassic uh, Fight Club? It's very popular, it's among kids in, okay. Good, you don't watch it because it's bizarre, because they pitch in a modern day great white with a megalodon and a tusker with something else. 
But what it did was in one of the episodes, they put Rajasaurus with a T-Rex. And, you know, everybody worked out the morphology, the physiology, the size of the jaw, the size of the bite and things like that. And this guy, the paleontologist from Fields Museum said that he, this creature, not he, sorry, it would have been like Mike Tyson. Short, sturdy, ounce for ounce, pound for pound, possibly more effective than any heavyweight fighter. Okay? And that's why we know that although it's smaller in size, it was possibly very, very effective. And it lived also in a forest that had much shorter trees. America, being a larger landmass, had big forests and therefore also big creatures. And India had smaller broken forests, smaller uh, herbivores on which predators like this fed. So it's, it's, you know, there's a land size proportion which is called the Bergman's rule. I'm not going to bore you with it. But this is a common thing that we see in, in, uh, in predators. Next slide, please. So a Russian scientist, uh, sorry, a Russian paleo artist who works in the, uh, sorry, a Ukrainian uh, artist, paleo artist based in Kiev, was very kind enough to draw this image for me. And this actually shows uh, three important predators in India and one titanosaur which is being fed upon. So the Rajasaurus, which is on your extreme left, and you've got Indosaurus, which are the two uh, guys ganging up against the Rajasaurus, and the one in front is the Indosuchus, you know. Uh, so these are the three main predators that we've discovered in India, which are near complete. I mean, I wouldn't say they're fully complete, but we are, it's good enough for us to imagine how the creature would have looked, right? Titanosaurus, we found enough bones. We've got enough bones of... Uh, uh, Barapasaurus, the one that I talked to you about, Sohan Lal Jain. Next slide, please. Nishtha, next slide. Okay. We have an immense variety of fossils, and one of the real treasures that India has is uh, the variety of eggs, dinosaur eggs that we find. And this is from a museum, an outdoor museum just outside of Ahmedabad called Indodra. Right? And these are dinosaur eggs, and this is a dinosaur nest. They've not been placed there. It's actually set in rock. Okay? Next slide, please. And if you were to go to the actual site, people have been taking these out and selling them for, a, you know, for 100 rupees or whatever you're willing to give. Because there's plenty of it. The problem is because every, everybody thought there's plenty of it, they started looting it, and today it's getting difficult for you to actually find more of these. They would naturally exist just outside from Baroda to Indore, the, all along the Narmada. There's a very famous uh, fossil bed called the Lameta fossil bed. The one I told you right in front, uh, right in the beginning, when William Sleeman found, uh, where he found his first fossils. It's the same uh, fossil bed that goes till the mouth of Narmada, right? So this is the current state of how fossils are kept. If everybody gets to know there's a fossil, They'll, they'll get a chisel and a, and a hammer and start taking things out. Next slide, please. But there are some places where they get conserved. There's this temple of, uh, uh, of a tribal community in, uh, in uh, Dhar district of Madhya Pradesh, and you find this, uh, I mean, they did not want us to photograph it, but we really persisted, and you know, it's, it's going to serve science, and people are going to know about your deity, all those kind of things, and they let us take this uh, picture. And if you notice, they're concentric circles, which are eggs. And they thought this is a Maha Shi Shiv Lingam, you know, it's a, it's a big Shiv Lingam where several uh, links have come together and, uh, and have got pieced together. So, next slide, please. Next slide, please. The other great discovery that we make is coprolite. It's a polite term for dinosaur dung. Okay? Now, what, what should we be doing with fossilized shit, right? Well, it tells you something about their diet. It tells you, and we are able to reconstruct the forest of the time, because if they've eaten a certain kind of foliage, we can imagine what they've eaten, right? Or if it is a meat eater, we know what kind of meat he's eaten, right? But what we discovered in this particular coprolite was something remarkable. Paleobotanists had thought that Grasses had evolved in China 
and much later, much after the time of the dinosaurs. But this coprolite, when you analyze the structure of the grain of it, it was found, they found the structure of what's found on the blade of a grass. It's called phytolith. It's a silica compound which assembles itself like the tiles of a, on a roof. And it's something that is used by grasses to deter heavy browsing. Okay? So plants have their own defense, right? So this is, the, so we found those silica tile-shaped cells called phytoliths in this dung, this conserved dung or this fossilized dung. And it was, it's an amazing discovery made by scientists in India. Uh, Professor Vandana Prasad at uh, Birbal Sahani Institute of Paleontology, Lucknow, was the person who led this research. And she changed the time scales about how, how and when grasses evolved. Next slide, please. While we have several successes in how we report or how we find uh, fossils, some of the discoveries that we make are momentous, they're incredible and the, you know, yay moment. But you know, what happens is, because of the lack of resource and sometimes lack of commitment, uh, they get lost. I'm just going to tell you about this fossil that was discovered. Now you see pictures on your left, right? They make no sense. They got published in a journal. It looks like any piece of rock. On the right are drawings, hand drawings, very naively drawn, of things that you actually see on your left. Next slide, please. Now what the scientists did was to assemble. They found the bones, and they said that they found the hip and the femur, which is the leg bone. And they, they, they were so large that they could not transport them. So they left it behind saying that it's going to be safe here, nobody's going to touch it, it's in the back of beyond, and we'll come back later when we have more resources to ship it back to a laboratory. Okay? In the meantime, they start writing the paper, analyzing the, the photographs that they have, and publish the paper. The next year when they come to the site, the fossils are gone because they've been, there was a massive flood. They've either got inundated or they got washed away, we don't know what happened to them. Right? So the question is, in science, you need to have a record of all your fossils. Because once you say that I have discovered this fossil, you need to prove it to another scientist who wants to examine it. Right? It's a repository. They didn't have any of this in a repository, and it was lost. But what they reconstructed was a creature which could have possibly been the biggest ever to live on land. And it was called Bruhati Kayosaurus, which means in Sanskrit, huge-bodied dinosaur. It was discovered in 1989. The paper got published in 1990. In September 1990, when the two scientists went there, they could not find the fossils. Nothing. So we've got no remains of this giant creature. Right? So there have been several such instances where fossils have got lost. But one of the tragedies is that even today, one of the best places to find fossils in India is not going to a dig or to go to an expedition. Just go out, outside of a geology department. What happens is, as soon as a professor either publishes an important paper or is about to retire, they don't know what to do with the fossils that they've collected over several years that they've been working. Right? So they, there's no way of storing that repository of or the body of fossils that they've collected. And all of that is just thrown out. Because the next professor comes in, the next academic comes in, and his area of research or her area of research would be completely different. And it means nothing to have the fossils that you've collected and published for. They're all gone. So it's very, very easy for you to go and find a fossil outside a geology department or a paleontology department in, in in universities in India. Next slide, please. You have to keep an eye on the time for me. OK, sorry. Uh, another major discovery, we found a snake. We, as in paleontologists in India, found a wonderful snake from the place where you find eggs, right? And Rajasaurus was discovered. A giant snake uh, which got submerged in a sudden mud, uh, mud slide that happened, possibly a flash flood, and which was feasting on uh, eggs of a sauropod. 
So, and it's all of it, all this drama has been captured in a large slab of sandstone. Next slide, please. Not far from here, in Jaisalmer, in a village called Thayat, there is a long uh, sandstone uh, slab on which you have footprints of a very small dinosaur that lived about 180 million years ago. And if you look at, uh, it's a one rupee coin and that uh, trident-shaped depression is a footprint of a dinosaur. Next slide, please. And that dinosaur would have looked something like this. And again, this has been drawn by a friend of mine. I mean, I've only met him virtually. But he was kind enough for me for, 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 you know, for, to, to draw this for me. Because it's a, you know, he was excited by the discovery of this footprint. And he said, can I draw it? And would Indian media like to take it up? Unfortunately, it didn't find the space at the time when it was discovered. So you know, although the effort was there. Next slide, please. I think, Pranay, okay. um, we need to get into the extinction um, okay. and, and get a sense of how long they ruled. Because we, we sometimes hear, I mean, the, you know, when people say that that guy is a dinosaur, uh, they mean that, you know, he's somebody who is extinct, he's gone, he belongs to another age. But aren't they among the most successful life forms ever? Well, absolutely. I think um, among all land living creatures in, in the large bodied form, uh, the dinosaurs are possibly the most successful creatures ever to have lived. They were, they were diverse. They lived in very, very difficult circumstances. They used to have annual migratory uh, patterns. They also survived snow and hail and frozen conditions. They lived in deserts. They lived in tropical forests. There was an immense variety of dinosaurs that lived across the world and in virtually every continent. And Next slide, please. I'll just uh, come to that. Right. So they lived for about 170 million years. So we've been, for example, uh, our immediate ancestors, I mean, our earliest ancestor, Homo sapiens, emerged about 210,000 years ago, right? And they've been there for 170 million years ago. Human, our ancestors, earliest Indians to arrive in India on the banks of Indus was about 70,000 years ago. So 70,000 versus 170 million, okay? So that's the scale that we are talking about, okay? So we've been on Earth for like a fraction of a second in that sense, right? They, they were on, on land and they did uh, so much in terms of diversifying and successfully occupying every niche, every, every habitat that you could imagine. That was the elegance, or that, that was the beauty of the dinosaurs. So we, so have, we have 10 minutes, Pranay, to, I think, to tell this incredible story that you have about the, the newest theories about the extinction of okay, dinosaurs. Okay, I'll come to that. Yeah. So just to give you a sense again of, uh, of space, uh, you know, this is the time when Earth started looking like, I mean, the countries that, that exist today began to take shape. So India was nestled between Australia and Africa and Antarctica. Next slide, please. But 120 million years later, uh, India was started to pair away from the other land masses. But 88 million years ago, you have this massive volcanic activity that happens uh, just west of Mangalore. And Madagascar and India pair, uh, separate off. Next slide, please. Next slide. What I'm trying to say here is that all these events is something that dinosaurs survived. And they survived and used it to their advantage. They, every new landmass that created isolated them. And each isolation event helped them to evolve separately from the ancestral population that existed. Right? So what I'm trying to tell you here is that something that survives among us today, and if you remember, my first slide was rise and rise of dinosaurs. It was not rise and fall of dinosaurs, because dinosaurs live among, amongst us. And they live in, amongst us in the form of birds. Right? So dinosaurs, no, sorry, please. Yeah. So dinosaurs shrank in size over time. So 220 million years ago, they were massive. But around 160 million years ago, they started shrinking in size, started getting feathers. And around 70 million years ago, we know that the first birds were there. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. 
68 million years ago was a very momentous time for planet Earth. A massive volcanic event began to take place in the Indian Ocean. It's a very primordial Indian Ocean which is forming, but somewhere where the Reunion Island is today is where the, there was a massive volcanic neck that rose from below and started spewing lava. Spewing lava on land on India and under the ocean. But what it did was started to poison the earth. But it did not happen in a, as a single event. It was sporadic and it happened in three different uh, episodes. The first episode was a minor episode. It was about 68 million years ago and we have evidence of that just a little west from here in Jhalavar. The first episode of uh, of Deccan lava flow is not in the Deccan, but it's in at the base of the Aravali in a, in a place called Jhalavar. Next slide, please. So what it does, the second episode was the massive one. It was so huge that it produced so much greenhouse gas that it covered the earth. Now notice that the position of India was close to the equator. Now if a volcanic event, like if you remember this famous a uh, volcanic event that happened in Iceland about, about a couple of years ago. The, the name of the volcano was completely, a complete tongue twister. Nobody could pronounce it, right? But, but what, because Iceland was in, right in the north, it did not go all around the earth, right? But now because India and the Indian Ocean was close to the equator, any emissions that were happening would go all around the equator and then spread north and south. So very quickly, the greenhouse gases, the sulfur dioxide, and the particulate, more importantly, covered the entire globe. And the large trees were the first to die out because there was no sunlight. It started becoming hot, and they could not survive. If the large tree dies, the large dinosaurs die, right? If the large dinosaurs die, the big predators die. I mean, they could. Uh, feed or scavenge on the dying uh, big-bodied herbivores, but that would be, in terms of, you know, millions of years, it means nothing, right? I mean, you could feast for a month, a year, or two years, but when you're talking of millions of years, it's nothing, right? When you're talking of survival, right? Next slide, please. Now, this is what how Deccan lava would have looked like in episode two, okay? Now, this is what it looked like. It was like a massive landfill catching fire. Okay? And you would have huge stacks of smoke rising uh, all through the day and night and not ceasing ever. And this would have taken place for about 150,000 years continuously over a, a size of Spain and France put together. Okay? Next slide, please. And this is how, if you were to take a close-up of how those, you know, those orange spots that you saw at the horizon of that previous uh, uh, image would have looked like. These are called fire fountains. They're not massive volcanoes. Massive volcanoes just burst out and cease. But if you have to see massive, copious amount of magma or lava that needs to come out, it will come out slowly and will continue to come out over a very large area and create plateaus like, that, like the one you see in the Deccan, Deccan lava plateau. Next slide, please. They, in fact, call them flood lavas, don't they? Which yeah, is flood a, lava. the word means, expresses the, correct, the way. Yeah. So they would flood the entire region. So one of the places where you still see a bit of flood lava is a province in Kamachatka in, in Russia, where you have fire fountains like this, and you see flowing, if you notice the, the flow that is happening, is happening all over this place and it's relatively flat. It's a, a mild hillock and it, get, it gets leveled and it rises again and becomes level again. Next slide, please. And this is what the flood lavas do. They, they create a layer cake effect. They, they grow one over the other. And if you, I'm, I'm sorry, the contrast is not so good on this, but I'm sure you can see the light green and the dark green and the light green and the dark green. That shows the different kind of vegetation that grows at different slopes or different kinds of soils. And, and what it shows is that the, these were the layers that were formed at different times. The youngest being right at top and the oldest layer being 
right at the bottom. Next slide, please. We have to wind up in one question. Sure. Um, this is another image of the layer cake. I think this is better. Next slide, please. We had some volcanic necks, and this is a beautiful volcanic neck that exists uh, near Indore. Unfortunately, it's being broken for creating grit and gravel. If you need, notice at the bottom right, it's being broken down to, make, to expand the highway between Baroda and Indore. So we had seven of these. I think there are only three of them remaining. And they're seen as an obstacle, so they're just broken down. In America, you would have to pay for it. You, you would have to spend $15 to see Devil's Neck uh, in, in, in America. But in India, it's, it's just an obstacle. Next slide, please. Uh, something like this, again, uh, just next to the highway in Dhar, you see these lovely columns. It's because of rapid cooling happening, and again, the flow starting. And you've got uh, you know, layer upon layer of these columns and stacks of volcanic rock that froze. Next slide, please. Uh, in Goa, and even in northern Karnataka, you find lava flows going into the sea. It's pretty evident. Next slide, please. And you have Bagh caves, very famous Buddhist caves in middle of uh, Dhar district, and uh, what I'm trying to show here is, between the two lava flows, you've got the Lameta limestone, the formation that I told you about, which is rich in fossils, in which uh, S William Sleeman found the, the rocks, the, the fossils and the rocks, in which had the, the bones of titanosaurs. And this is exactly the place where you will find uh, bones of dinosaurs. In fact, if you were to look closely in the Bagh cave, you will find fossils of dinosaurs embedded even today. Next slide, please. This is the bark bed. If you look at it closely, it's limestone, uh, and a, a very rich limestone, and you find uh, fossils in this. Next slide, please. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm going to now uh, present uh, something uh, which is very interesting, and what has happened in the last uh, couple of years, which is going to uh, possibly revolutionize the way we think about extinction. Uh, at least in terms of uh, what we have been believing so far about dinosaurs. The contemporary belief was, till until very recently, that all dinosaurs died in a flash, when a meteor hit uh, a place near, where is between Texas and Mexico, called the Chicxulub event, or, or the Yucatan meteor event, right? Well, over the last three or four years, scientists have been studying the rate of extinction and the time when all the dinosaurs got extinct. And they found exactly what I told you, that the, the Deccan lava started poisoning the skies, and the big dinosaurs started dying. And it was the big dinosaurs that died out first, and the smaller, smaller ones started to die last. And if you would, it, so what they've done is that over this four million year period, they've charted the extinctions of all the dinosaurs that exist in the world, in every repository. And they look for dinosaurs on when they go missing in a certain rock formation. That you find a dinosaur here, and then you stop finding this particular dinosaur in the next layer. Now that is conclusive proof that dinosaurs did not die off in a single strike. There was something that was killing them from earlier. What could be a possibility is that the final death knell could have been that meteor. But what we now are beginning to understand is that the Deccan lava had a very strong role, a very significant role in the decline and the demise of the dinosaurs also. And I think this now needs to come into the popular understanding that the Deccan and, and the, the climate change that it brought about was significant enough to cause the death of the dinosaurs. We have to go into questions, uh, Pranina. You know okay. what we can do is we can run okay, the, your, just, your comic take, things I'll at the back. I'll just take five more minutes, Pradeep, and okay. just show you something that I, I, I enjoy. Uh, can you do the next slide, please, Nishtha? OK, so dinosaurs have captured our imagination. And you know, in, in the 60s and 70s, some uh, Indian comics used to have this, right? So I mean, there's a Bengali uh, comic. A friend of mine, Nirmalya Mukherjee, sent this to me. and. Uh, this is again Chotu Motu and Motu Patlu, you know, two very popular characters. I used to read them. You know, uh, you see uh, Motu and Chotu sitting behind uh, a dinosaur like creature. Next slide, please. Again, uh, Hindi comics had, you know, when they wanted a superhero fighting a big 
monster, a creature of, you know, massive amount of, uh, you know, of viciousness and, and ferocity, then they would use a dinosaur-like creature. Next slide, please. We also use them in Hindi film, right? So Dara Singh especially has fought dinosaurs three times. I'm just going to show you one visual, and this is uh, Samson, a film in which Firoz Khan, Mumtaz, and Amita acted. Next slide, please. And the creature was something like this. Next slide, please. And here's a shot. I, so I watched it on YouTube. I suffered when I watched it yesterday, trying to get a good visual yesterday. And you know, it is, it's a cross between anything and anything, you know, of course. I mean, but you know, it's, it's a long-necked uh, grazer, but the teeth of, of, a, of a mutton eater, uh, of, a, of a meat eater. You know, it, it's, it's, uh, it, it's absolutely bizarre. Next slide, please. And there was another film, uh, this is a favorite of mine, it's called Gogola, it's free on YouTube, please see it, it's hilarious, if you really want to kill time, please see it. It's called Gogola, 1966, on the left, uh, there's uh, Tabassum, of those of you who remember her, you know, Pool Khile Hai Gulchan Gulchan, and all the sweet uh, films and, and, and serials that she used to do. And Gogola was a, uh, uh, you know, a soft uh, creature that rose from Nariman Point in Bombay, anybody from Bombay would know. That you know, they, he arose out of uh, you know, it's it's an Indian Godzilla if you want to say it in that way. So next slide, please. Uh, more recently, in 2017, there was a Bengali film called Jole Jongole, and uh, it had Mithun Chakravarti and uh, Jackie Shroff who go to rescue a friend who's got stuck in an uh, in a deep jungle somewhere, and the creature is behind. And I'm going, going to show you the creature in a little more detail. Next slide, please. And this is the creature. They don't know what to do with it. It's still outside Salt Lake somewhere, which is the photo photograph form, and completely bizarre. This creature cannot live in, in an evergreen forest or a dense forest because of the spines and the extravagant teeth and the, and, the, the, and the design of its body. There is no way such a large creature could have lived or survived or, or you know, even attacked other creatures. It's, it's just bizarre. But, you know, this is how it is. Uh, uh, you know, we, we've somehow, uh, our imagination is really running amok and our science is trailing back. I guess that's, what, uh, all I, that's all I have to say. Thank you so much. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you, Pranay. We have um, we, we run short of time, but there's probably just enough time for about three or four questions if they're, if they're short. Um, yes, would you please? On. Is it on? Good morning, sir. On the premise that uh, dinosaurs evolved from land creatures to flying creatures, could, could it be predicted that uh, animals which are on land now would, would fly within uh, millions of years? Could human beings fly <laughs> in that case? Okay, you're doing three or four questions? Okay, okay. Uh, good question. Nobody can predict uh, the, such uh, long trends of evolution. Uh, chances that any mammal other than a bat, which is also a glider flyer, uh, is very, very difficult. I mean, at least in the near future, I'm talking. And one million years in terms of evolution is very little. I think we'll have to think a little longer and bolder. Maybe you need a lot of plastic surgery. And that's why I think imagination of Bollywood and even Bollywood is very interesting. Maybe we need... Uh, you know, flims, uh, you know, uh, skin hanging from our elbows to our hips, and we would be able to glide. I think we've already started doing that with appendages, and you know, but uh, I don't think as a cause of you know evolving into it, it looks a little improbable. Thank you for your fascinating talk. There are two questions. One is what got you interested in dinosaurs to pursue this kind of work? And the second is what is the positioning of work done on dinosaurs within India at the global platform or global level? Thank Great you. question. Thank you so much for asking this. So um, uh, I'm uh, like Pradeep introduced me. I'm a geek. I had, I'm the guy you don't want to have in your class because I will ask you all the stupid questions and I will irritate you. So my teachers hated me and they never answered me because of, not because they hated me. But, you know, I had questions, and I had questions festering in my mind even when I turned into an adult. Uh, I could not understand why rivers that originate near Mahabaleshwar or Panjgani would not go into Arabian Sea but travel right across the Indian Peninsula and empty themselves in the Bay of Bengal. For example, this is a question that remained unaddressed till, the, till about 10 years ago. 
Um, so that's the reason why this book happened and my quest for answers to explain every uh, scientific or geologic or geographic uh, problem that is before us. So I like to explain it in terms of deep time and there is a rationale to why anything exists, right? So I think that answers your question number one. Question number two, what is the position of Indian paleontology vis-a-vis -vis the world? I think we have got great paleontologists. I think we've got great minds, uh, and globally, if you were to look at, uh, you know, we to see the best rated papers and stuff like that, we are, we are really right there. The challenge is they're not supported. Paleontology is always linked with economy and how, what is the economic contribution that your science is going to make in terms of, you know, miner, mineral prospecting or return to economy or return to funding of Department of Biotechnology or Department of Science and Technology. So those are the kind of criteria and metrics that uh, bureaucrats use, and I think that is perverse. Um, and I think that needs to change, because I think the future, and I think lots of people are saying this, that paleontology, biogeochemistry, and geology are going to inform the future about climate change. I have a very sad little story to tell about paleontology in India. We, we were traveling together to Pachmari um, last year, and we were going to be joined by a paleontologist from the GSI because we wanted to ask him questions, we wanted to ask him to show us some things and he cancelled his visit at the last moment and we said, why are you not coming? And he said, my department has been wound up. And we said, why? He said, well, because the government feels that paleontology doesn't matter enough, it's not important enough and they want us instead to go looking for you know, minerals that will earn foreign exchange. So while China has I think 110 new museums of paleontology and now lead the world in, in, in the field of paleontology just in the last 20 years. We're actually closing down our scientific institutions uh, of paleontology. But the other really distressing thing is that we're also destroying a number of sites of geological and paleontological uh, interest as we push out mindlessly in terms of building roads and building highways and that sort of stuff. Um, yes. Diverting the Narmada, does it open up sites or close sites? So diverting? When you divert something like the Narmada, does that allow you to find fossils in areas you wouldn't have or when does it close sites? The Narmada, does that allow you to find fossils in the, in the bed? Or does it close sites? Because Does of the show? flooding. If the river changes course, yeah. has it closed any sites because you have a lot near the Narmada? Right. Or does it open right. up sites because you can dig at places you couldn't have earlier? Right. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, there are some places where the river changes course naturally or whether it's by human action. And people have found uh, not just Narmada but other places also. I mean, the famous place is Red River which changes course in the US and one of the most exciting places to find fossils. Uh, another place in India is the Markandeya River, which is near Nahan, very famous for finding mammal fossils, and which changes course, uh, its course nearly every 15 years. And when it does that, it, it exposes a very nice fossil bed of uh, mammals that existed around 20 to 11 million years ago. Fascinating fossils, yeah, but yeah, that's an exciting thing for, uh, for, for fossil exploration. We have... Uh just over three minutes for maybe the last two questions. The gentleman in green. Uh, I wanted to know what were the other fauna and uh, flora, uh, fauna particularly in India at the time of the dinosaurs? Uh, okay, great question. So, you know, there was a decline of the, the uh, farms and the others. And what also happened is that the rise of the flowering plants was happening in the shadows of these palms and cycads and bamboos and other, other things. So, uh, you know, this is also a very interesting times in terms of the rise of the flowering plants. There were no flowering plants before uh, the time, before 140 million years ago. So dinosaurs come at around 215 million years ago and die at 68 million years ago. Uh, the flowering plants come dead in the center and actually make sure uh, actually ensure the evolution of the mammals because the mammals are the first to exploit the, the richness that the flowering plants have to offer. Okay, one last question. Um, at the back. 
Uh, fascinating talk. Uh, so my five-year-old son is a great fan of dinosaurs and for some reason he finds them cute. Uh, so first time when we told him that dinosaurs are no more, he was like very sad and almost into tears. But today it was very comforting to know that they are available in form of birds. So said, can all birds be traced to, all little small birds can be traced to dinosaur or is it some special big birds which can all. be traced to? No, all. It's all birds. Well, uh, so there would be some that, I mean, there would be an ancestral bird from which uh, there is a stock of birds which remain close to that ancestor. The others diverged and became more modern birds. But there would be an ancestral bird like, especially the flightless birds. The flightless bird, birds originated from Antarctica and they reached Australia, uh, southern uh, uh, South America, uh, Africa, Madagascar and India. So the ostrich actually entered India first and then went into Africa. So ostrich was alive in India till about 11,000 years ago. And the modern human, our ancestors 11,000 years ago would have encountered the ostrich in India. Right? So if you think that, you know, it's got extinct and, you know, all that, I mean, it's, it's so recent for us. I mean, yeah. Thank you, Pranay, for a wonderful, fascinating talk. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Pradeep Krishna.